welcome you all for this uh, COVID Pulse Pediatric Acute Care Training, uh, Pediatric Intensive Care Unit CMC Vellore Initiative. So today's topic is fluid therapy in ICU, which is very important and is very commonly encountered problems you might have. Dr. Kala will be talking on that and our moderator is Dr. Deepika. So far, we have, uh, you have had the opportunity to hear all these lectures and which are being recorded and it will be available in CMC YouTube soon by next week. And uh, today I'm very happy to introduce the moderator, Dr. Deepika Subramanian Pudukot, who is uh, at present, she is on a trainer higher specialty registrar, currently in the neonatal ICU, Leicester Royal Infirmary, University Hospitals of Leicester, NHS Trust and United Kingdom. After uh, her MBBS from Maharashtra, Maharashtra University Hospitals, uh, University Health of Health Sciences in uh, Mumbai. Uh, she did a DNB beats from Sir uh, Harkisan Das uh, Research Hospital and Institute. And after that, she uh, had a stint of as a senior resident and assistant professor in uh, ICU, in cardiac ICU and pediatric ICU in CMC Velo. After that, she went to uh, pursue her uh, further training in intensive care in the United Kingdom. She was as a senior clinical fellow in the University Hospitals of Leicester, and she got a RECMO fellowship and the MRCPCH UK. She is actively involved in a lot of quality audit in the ICU and research and has published papers and reputed journals. Welcome you, Deepika. We are very happy to have you as a moderator today. Over to you to introduce the speaker and the topic. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. I can't say I'm elated, but also I'm privileged and honored to be even um, be here. So, um, so what to say about Kalangam? So she is one of the role model for me, and that just uh, says uh, not only for me, I'm sure for many of us. Uh, not only in CMC days, she'd continue to be uh, one. So uh, Kalangam has been professor and head of pediatric intensive care unit in CMC Vellore. Um, I'm not sure for how, how long, but then since the time I've left CMC, she was there before and will be there. So she is uh, also one of the faculty members for Pediatric Intensive Care Unit and Department of Peds uh, for in CMC Vellore. She is a PALS as well as IP, um, IAP uh, BLS instructor. She's been examiner and she is an examiner for MDDNB uh, fellowships of various universities across the national board. And she has, she has over uh, more than 40 publications uh, in a very well uh, uh, authorized uh, and also authorized chapters in IAP, uh, ICU protocol book. So as I said, Kalamam is very compassionate and a dynamic leader uh, in our uh, unit. And to you Kalamam for a very, I'm very looking forward for the uh, talk today. It's very important, uh, very basic, yet very complicated fluids and uh, electrolytes. So firstly, I want to thank Ebor uh, for organizing this tremendous task of uh, organizing a series of lecture. It is an offshoot of our COVID uh, preparedness uh, in terms of our third, third wave. Uh, and I also want to thank Deepika for your time. Sometimes the student learns from the teachers and then the cycle reverses and the teacher learns from the students. So the pleasure is mine. <laughs> okay, so let's just go to the topic as we have lost some time. So today's topic is on fluid therapy and electrolyte imbalance in ICU. So it's a simple uh, topic, very basic. Which one of us have not written an IV fluid or uh, which of us have not read electrolytes? However, we thought it was a good idea to include this in our session, this session, uh, for three reasons. Number one, uh, fluid therapy is very much integral part of your uh, pediatric intensive care. If you do your ventilation right, and but if you mess up your fluids, these outcomes are not going to be good. And secondly, with the advancement of pediatric uh, intensive care, um, there have been some developments and uh, people have reviewed and relearned, uh, re-changed uh, the parental fluid therapy. And, uh, and also because uh, we thought it's a good idea to review our uh, electrolytes and basics, although we may have read, 
uh, it is always good to read and reread and relearn and uh, uh, reinforce some of the knowledge gap that we may have. And for these reasons, uh, we have uh, included this topic. And uh, so what I'm going to do today is to review maintenance fluid therapy and replacement fluids and to show you some electrolyte imbalance. These are focused case histories. But what I'm not going to do is to cover uh, management of shock or fluid therapy in shock. And I will also not be covering electrolyte imbalance in a comprehensive way uh, uh, in the sense uh, talking about the functions and the pathophysiology, etc. So these are just uh, examples or just uh, specimens no, of uh, electrolyte, common electrolyte disturbances that we might see in while handling critically ill children. Okay, so a six-year-old boy uh, is in pediatric IC. He's underwent liver transplant and he's losing 1,200 ml of ascitic fluid through the drain. What should be the fluid plan? Another child is in the pediatric ward, six years old, admitted with dengue fever and shock. Child has been resuscitated and how much fluid should be planned in the 24 hours? What regimen should I follow? And uh, another boy, three years, uh, pediatric emergency, treated for asthma, oxygen, bronchodilators. He's better, but not yet drinking adequately. What type of fluid therapy does he need? So let's find the answers. Uh, so this is a pathetic picture of a cholera epidemic, which swept uh, all over the world, 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, India was badly affected. Wikipedia, if you look up, it says some 8 million deaths alone in India. However, it led to uh, research and um, to cut the long story short, um, uh, parental fluid was finally introduced in the 1950s. Okay, so our pediatric training, uh, we, we, we learned and we taught that fluid therapy consists of three modes. One is deficit therapy where we replaced uh, fluid deficit if present, and then maintenance therapy for a child who's not able to eat and drink, and then replacement therapy, which is replacement of ongoing loss. So that still remains. However, with the advancement of your, uh, with the introduction of PALS, advanced life support, and things like that in the 1990s, the fluid, uh, re, uh, fluid management was kind of a upgraded to four phases. The first one is a resuscitation phase where fluid boluses are given quickly. And then a titration phase where usually we sort of turn off uh, ongoing or the child does not need any ongoing fluid balance, uh, fluid boluses. And, um, and uh, we sort of take an account of what has been done and transition the child into a maintenance phase. And then finally the convalescent phase. Okay, so let's just pause. Now let's go back to our maintenance fluid. I said parental fluid therapy was introduced in the 1950s. In 1957, uh, Holiday and Sega, the famous, they published their paper, which, uh, which had the formula for uh, calculating maintenance fluid therapy in children. Now they hypothesized that uh, water requirement is a function of caloric expenditure. So they calculated how much calorie a child would expend in a year, basal rate, active uh, activity, etc. And then they uh, extrapolated it to water requirement. And then they arrived at this famous Holiday and Sagar formula, which is uh, which we all are familiar with. For the first 10 kilo, it's 100 mils per kilo. For the second 10 kilo, it is 50, 1000 plus 50 and then it is 1,500 plus 20. We all are familiar with this. Um, if you convert it into per hour, and then it gave a formula, 4 to 1 formula, which is which was very convenient, easy to follow. Okay, now the sodium requirement per day is 2 to 3 milliequivalents per kg, and the potassium requirement is 1 to 2 milliequivalents per kg, and we added 5% dexose. Therefore, we arrived at now N by 4 saline plus 20 milliequivalents per liter of potassium, which is the isolate P, which was always kept in your pediatric ward shelves, whereas the adult wards had either DNS or normal saline fluid. Okay. Now, the maintenance fluid um, also aims to replace your, uh, when a child is not eating or, or able to drink, then the maintenance fluid aims to replace their losses, which is urinary and insensible loss. And if you work out that way, it sort of back, back uh, sort of, uh, it correlates to your holiday and cigar formula as well. 
So, uh, um, what does maintenance fluid aims? It aims to prevent dehydration, prevent electrolyte disorders, prevent ketoacidosis, and prevent protein dehydration in a child who is not able to eat or drink. But remember, maintenance fluid is able to give only 20% of the normal caloric need. This is with 5% drink. So, therefore, if you maintain your patient on prolonged periods after the first few days, weight loss is bound to occur. So, remember that. So, the, there is a myth among our, pop, our, our patients that IV fluid is the ultimate and that will cure, which, which is not. So it's enough to sustain a patient, patient a child for the first one, three or four days. Okay, now fast forward 50 years. Okay, In the early 2000s, reports of hyponatremia began to appear in hospitalized children. And generally hyponatremia uh, in, uh, in the entire population supposedly only about 2%, but then these reports showed an incidence of 25 to 30%. And some of these children, as a result of hyponatremia, developed serious neurological morbidity and some even uh, suffered from death. Uh, these reports came from UK mainly and then Australia, and in UK there were litigations uh, as well. So following which people started seriously reviewing uh, our fluid uh, fluid management. Okay, while uh, while there, in, in countries like us, in our clinical practice, it was not uncommon to see a child like this with, uh, with a significant or severe tissue edema after the child uh, would have been resuscitated with uh, fluid boluses. And then subsequently, fluids are used as drug diluents and, uh, uh, of course, maintenance fluids. And then there is inherent capillary leak, which is uh, due to the sepsis. And all these uh, means that the child infant was heavily water and salt overloaded uh, in the first 24, 12 to 24 hours. So, so this is what we clinicians were seeing. Meanwhile, some smart researchers, they delved into, they dug a bit deeper and uh, they were able to show that the mortality increased from 40 to 60 percent with fluid overload of 10 to 20 percent. So that was very significant. This is independent of the severity of illness. So the argument that, okay, the patients came sicker and therefore they received more fluid and therefore they died does not hold here because um, this increased mortality due to fluid overload was independent of the severity of illness. Now, this person is uh, very famous. He is uh, Mr. Emmanuel Rivers, and he is the author of the Early Goal Directed uh, Therapy, which forms the basic of your uh, fluid resuscitation uh, therapy. In his studies, he had 263 patients, um, and he set three goals. Get the CVP to 8 to 12, get a MAP to 6. These are just an adult study, 65 to 90, and an SCVO2 of over 70. Okay, these are the three goals he set. And with these three goals, uh, when the fluid boluses were titrated to achieve these goals, he they were able to show a significant reduction in mortality. And uh, patients who received, uh, who were in the early goal directed therapy, received more fluids, okay, 5 liter as compared to 3.5 liters in the standard therapy. However, though, uh, following uh, a few years later, when this study was reviewed by, and it was found that actually the patients who did well had received less fluid in the, uh, in the 7 to 72 hour uh, window period. So again, there was a two liter gap in the fluid regimen. Okay, if that was not enough, we uh, we also realized, uh, we also understood the frank Starling uh, curve better. Uh, so the frank Starling curve says that preload, if you increase the preload, then your force of contraction increase or your uh, cardiac output increases. Uh, but then we understood, now this holds true only if your cardiac uh, muscle is uh, functioning uh, at the steep part of the curve. And if it is in the flat part of the curve, then this phenomenon does not happen. And in fact, the child is likely to go into pulmonary edema and deteriorate. And then we realize that many of our patients are actually in the flat part of curve with poor myocardial performance. 
Okay, then came the final nail in the coffin, uh, which is the Feast Trial, which was published 2011, 11 years after the early goal directed therapy. And this was a large trial which was conducted in sub-Saharan Africa. About 3,000 children were included. Half of them had malaria. And uh, this is what they showed. Um, so those children who received fluid boluses uh, had higher mortality. Okay, and both. So those who received saline as well as albumin, it, it didn't matter whether they received or saline or albumin, but they had a higher mortality if they received bolus. Okay, so this kind of baffled the ICU and the emergency uh, uh, physician community. Uh, and uh, then we also realized that holiday cigar does have some pitfalls. It is uh, based on requirement of active children. Uh, the energy expenditure in critically ill children might be as low as 50 to 60 calories. ICUs are now air conditioned, so the insensible loss is less. Many patients are, they are intubated with advancements in intensive care and things like that. We were humidifying. And therefore, um, uh, and therefore, uh, it's likely that we were giving more, uh, more uh, free water to our patients. Also, um, all these conditions are prevalent in uh, sick children. They had respiratory disease, hypovolemia, hypotension. These children are anxious. They are stressed, uh, pain, and they, are, uh, they have dr multiple drugs and uh, all these or non-osmotic stimuli for the hormone SIADH. Uh, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, these children are all at risk for the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. So overall, we were administering far too much hypertonic fluid for sick children in the ICU. So this was followed by editorials which said, maybe we should abandon N by 5 saline in favor of uh, normal saline. So this was 2014. Uh, while the conservative group, they argued, uh, oh, sodium uh, saline has higher sodium content. Its osmolality is high. Uh, chloride is high. And large volume infusions of normal saline is known to cause hyperchloremic acidosis. Um, saline causes extra uh, ECF volume expansion and can cause hypertension, especially in children with renal problems. And uh, it is not suitable for malnourished children, which is common in uh, a developing country scenario. And uh, so uh, then uh, drug companies came up with a balanced electrolyte solution, and uh, which is uh, plasma lights. So I've just shown you the uh, table. So uh, normal saline had sodium of 154, which was dropped to 140 in the plasma light. Then between was ringer lactate, it was always available. That sodium is 130. Um, chloride again was dropped from 154 to 98. Um, ringer lactate contains lactate, 20, uh, uh, 28 millimoles per liter, and that can be a problem in critically ill children because we do monitor lactate level, and therefore in plasma light, lactate was changed to acetate uh, at 28 and gluconate 23. Okay, and the osmolality was sort of brought close to uh, your serum osmolality. So when it was introduced, uh, the price was high. It was about uh, 300, 350 rupees, but now the price is as uh, equivalent to a bottle of uh, normal saline. Okay. Now in 2019, however, this um, uh, IAP has rubbished all concerns and they have uh, issued a fairly strong recommendation that maintenance fluid in children has to be uh, normal saline and uh, dextrose and potassium chloride can be added and it does not increase uh, the risk of hypertonicity. This is uh, RCH Melbourne guideline, which is quite freely available. It has guidelines on every clinical, uh, uh, every clinical condition and they recommend uh, normal saline as your first fluid uh, sorry, saline with glucose 5%, which is dextrose normal saline. And the substitutes or the secondary choice are either plasma light or ringer lactate. Uh, this is NICE guideline, which is UK based, and they recommend normal saline even for neonates. And they just issue a warning that in certain neonates, it may be high. But for children, for sure, they are uh, routinely recommending uh, isotonic crystalloid, which contains sodium in the range of 130 to 154. This is Malaysian protocols, almost the same. 
so every um, many places uh, people have changed over to uh, dns in uh, icu we have changed but i think in our general pediatric ward people still use uh, n by 2 saline i have not found any indian guideline it is something to think about so you can apply it in your uh, practice as well now let's move on to the uh, replacement of uh, fluid um, uh, so uh, in children with acute diarrhea they may have ongoing losses children with severe dengue can have ongoing losses post operative condition burns and uh, diuretic phase of these are all some examples where you must look for ongoing losses and these ongoing losses can be either visible then it is easy it can be visible and measurable uh, ng drain stool loss and urine loss but sometimes as in children with dengue fever the losses are invisible and then you have to only estimate uh, clinically and replacement of fluid bolus is easy you have to uh, volume is easy you have to just replace it mill for mill as an isotonic saline sometime when there is large urinary loss especially uh, children with obstructive uropathy as as you relieve their obstruction they can void large volumes of urine urine concentration of sodium is more like n by 2 saline Okay, just remember then sometime in those situation you will have to replace say 80% of your uh, loss when you are doing replacement fluid always reassess and the iv plan has to be done 2 to 3 hourly you cannot plan replacement fluid for 24 hours just remember that okay and uh, uh, improve your clinical skills of assessing fluid balance i know physical physical signs do have limited sensitivity and specificity but with good practice you can improve your own sensitivity uh, to pick up the volume status of your patient uh, review of available hemodynamic data like vital signs or intake output chart uh, is important uh, please be nice to your nurses who capture all these numbers uh, for you a uh, fluid challenge is not recommended anymore because uh, change in pre once you administer the fluid it is cannot be removed um, cvp again uh, is on its way out pulmonary capillary wet pressure is no longer done um, a passive leg raising test i think dr siva uh, talked about it yesterday so i will skip it uh, pulse pressure variation uh, most of the intermediate monitors they give it you need an arterial line for it however it has its own limitations because you need patient to be reasonably paralyzed or well sedated with very little spontaneous breathing and the tidal volume has to be uh, 8 ml we don't use 8 ml anymore we don't even we in modern intensive care paralysis is done very less and uh, therefore its utility has a uh, very uh, limited value ultrasound is is the future it will come Uh, it is worth investing in an ultrasound uh, machine, and this is the view that they commonly use to assess fluid status. It's a long-axis view of the IVC. You can see the heart, and on the left side, and the liver, the dense uh, part, and then the part. And so you have to look at the IVC size and also the variability with the respiration. If it is full and not so variable, then it suggests a, flu uh, a fluid, um, a fluid um, adequately uh, fluid status. okay so the new mantra in uh, fluid management of critically ill child is early adequate uh, goal directed fluids and followed by late conservative fluids which means you are you are restricted and then finally there is a small role for late goal directed fluid removal which i'll come to uh, a bit later and remember the four d's draw uh, fluid also has to be administered as a drug it has to be dosed duration has to be specified and as soon as the child is ready to eat and drink just stop it stop the iv fluids okay so that concludes the first session and we'll just move on to the uh, second uh, part which is electrolyte imbalances in uh, piku So sodium is the main uh, is the predominant uh, electrolyte in the uh, extracellular fluid compartment and uh, it is uh, the main uh, factor that determines your uh, osmolar osmotic pressure and osmolality okay and uh, the total uh, just to review remember the total body water is 60% of your body weight 60 to 70 in uh, babies and uh, the body water is distributed in two compartments icf is a larger compartment two third and the ecf is one and between the two compartments water can move across freely and the movement of water is determined by your uh, osmolarity or which is again by main determinant of your osmolarity is sodium so remember sodium disturbances always cause uh, uh, water disturbances 
So remember that. So that is important. Okay, let's just look at some case scenario. So this is a three-year-old child who has come with a fever, cough, and cold for two days to the outpatients. Child is alert, afebrile, vitals are stable, GCS is uh, 15. Uh, the child has multiple xanthomas, and therefore someone decided to do some blood test. Uh, the counts are normal. Sodium is 126, potassium is 3.8, bicarb 20. Total cholesterol is very high, 1,520, and serum osmolality is 290. So what do you think? What should the first-year MD resident who's sitting in outpatient do to this child? So the correct answer is nothing need to be done. So here this patient has a familial uh, hypercholesterolemia with this condition is called pseudohyponatremia. Okay, so hyponatremia definition is less than 135, mild 130 to 135, moderate is 125 to 130, and severe is 120. Okay, now, any time you see a low sodium, first exclude sampling errors. Any Is a sample obtained from a vein um, close to uh, infusion of you know, hypotonic fluid saline, how it was asked. So just rule out sampling error. Once you've done that, then uh, the, there is a condition, it's called pseudohyponatremia. And uh, pseudohyponatremia is actually a laboratory artifact. And it is seen in the presence of high protein or lipid content, like the patient that we saw. Um, so because of that, there is less water content in the sample. And um, so in modern uh, te te biochemical technology, this is not present because they now use ion selective electrodes. Um, so it is not so commonly seen, but it is good to know. Um, here, the measured plasma osmolality will be normal, okay, pseudohyponatremia. Another close condition is called factitious. So factitious also is actually miss, uh, the wording is missing because if you look up, if you Google up what's the uh, meaning of factitious, it means uh, not genuine. So that's also sort of uh, borders towards pseudo, but it is not pseudo. They are two different conditions. They're very, they, they're very close, but not quite the same. So translocational hyper hyponatremia or factitious hyponatremia or dilutional hyponatremia is seen when there is a hyperosmolar agent present in the in the plasma typical examples are glucose mannitol and some poisons and uh, here the plasma osmolality is high so just a quick word on osmolarity so osmolarity uh, can be measured in the lab or it can be calculated so the formula for calculating osmolarity is 2 into sodium plus blood urea nitrogen divided by 2.8 plus glucose divided by 18. Uh, the numbers 2.8 and 18 are to convert from milligrams to millimoles to international so if your hospital gives values in millimoles you just have to substitute them um, the calculated osmolarity is lower than the measured osmolarity Okay, and the difference is usually less than 10. And this is another gap in medicine. There are other gaps also. This is osmolar gap. So the gap between calculated osmolality and the measured osmolality is osmolar gap. And that is usually less than 10. And that is true hyponatremia. In both translocational and pseudohyponatremia, the osmolar gap will be more than 10. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, what is effective osmolarity? So, effective osmolarity is otherwise known as tonicity. So, osmolarity is 2 into sodium plus urea plus glucose. But in most situations, urea is an ineffective osmol. It is very diffusible. So, just like how water moves across the compartments uh, uh, through the semi-permeable membrane, urea also is a small molecule and it is diffusible. So, in most conditions, urea is not considered as an effective osmol. The only exception is in uh, acute renal failure when patients are undergoing dialysis. Okay, There it can cause Di uh, dialysis disequilibrium syndrome, supposing the urea fa falls too much with uh, dialysis. Apart from that situation, most situations urea is, um, is an ineffective osmol. So you take away urea from the equation. So effective osmolarity is only sodium plus glucose. And remember, glucose contributes to osmolarity and, and tonicity, especially in the absence of insulin. So let's look at another case who's come to casualty. This is an eight-year-old child. She presents with abdominal pain for one week. She's breathless for one day and lethargic for 12 hours. So somebody has run the test as usual. And these are the labs. Glucose is high, 650. Ketones are 4 plus. pH is 7.1 and acidosis. Uh, bicarb is 9. 
Sodium is come as 127, potassium is 5.4, and urea. So now for teaching purpose, let's just ignore the other things. Now you must have diagnosed that this child has diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay. Now what, let's just look at the sodium alone. So here the sodium is 127, which is hyponatremia. So this is an example of translocational or dilutional hyponatremia. So this hyponatremia is secondary to the high glucose. So, so glucose is high and therefore it exerts osmotic effect and therefore water moves into the ECF and therefore causing dilutional hyponatremia. So you can should correct the sodium. So the corrected sodium here will be, uh, you use a factor of 1.6 for every 100 of glucose above 250. So here the glucose is uh, 650 and therefore uh, about 250. So 400, no, about 250. So it's 1.6 into 4, which is equal to 6.4. So the corrected sodium is 133. Now, what is the point in doing these calculations? There is a practical application. Remember, glucose is an effective osmol. Now, when you start treatment for DKA with fluid and then you're giving insulin, plasma glucose is expected to drop. And therefore, the osmolality, you know, the osmot effect of, of glucose will start to drop. And in this situation, it is important to maintain your corrected sodium so that it doesn't drop. So it's a good idea to keep an eye on corrected, corrected sodium. This is uh, one of the interventions, uh, one of the maneuvers, or one of the um, important aspects to prevent cerebral edema in a child with DKA. So now case three uh, is a child with nephrotic syndrome. Hmm. Uh, she's the child is four years and uh, she's on steroids and also on Lasix. Child presents to casualty with diarrhea and abdominal pain, fever, seizures. Her vitals, uh, she's tachycardic, 140, respiratory rate is 40, blood pressure 84 by 40, which is just above the 50th centile for age. Extremities are poor, poor pulses, anasarca is present. She's drowsy and also irritable, abdomen distended, tender with free fluid. Okay, so I think you've got an idea of what this child is having. Now, uh, the CMO, smart CMO from casualty has sent some bloods and ready with the results. Serum sodium is 118, potassium is 4.8, calcium 7, bicarb is 15, uh, so mild acidosis. Hemoglobin is 10, total count is elevated and platelets 15,000. So what should be an approach to this child? So do simple basic uh, working diagnosis as always. Um, so the working diagnosis here will be nephrotic syndrome. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis because it is common. Nephrotics are known to develop it. Here, the abdomen is distended and tender. Um, the physiological diagnosis or the physiological state here will be compensated um, uh, shock, likely to be hypovolemic shock, but you will keep septic shock in the back of your mind and uh, hyponatremia. So, what type of hyponatremia is this? So, here the sodium is less than 120. So, this is severe hyponatremia and less than 120 and also uh, let's just look at what is the type of hyponatremia or what caused this hyponatremia so this child is a child with nephrotic syndrome uh, he has diarrhea so it's likely the child uh, had uh, has fluid volume deficit as a result of excess loss of fluids he's on diuretics that could have contributed and therefore this is most likely to be depletional or hypovolemic hyponatremia his sensorium is poor and that is likely to be due to a combination of factors such as dehydration, uh, compensated shock and possibly because of hyponatremia. So here you can call this as symptomatic severe hyponatremia. Okay, remember here though that typically nephrotic syndrome is actually an example of hyper hypervolemic hyponatremia because in nephrotic syndrome they have hypoalbuminemia and low oncotic pressure and that leads to high levels of RAAS system and therefore the whole total body water in nephrotic is actually high so if you put that into the equation then this child is likely to have acute which is due to diarrhea depletional on a chronic pre-existent hyponatremia okay now let us look at the algorithms algorithms are always good uh, approach to hyponatremia. So first exclude the first two clauses, the uh, pseudo and the factitious uh, uh, hyponatremia, which you will do by estimating your osmolality. Okay, so that is out now. And then depending upon the volume status, you classify uh, into hypovolemic, euvolemic, 
and hypervolemic. So the typical cause for hypovolemic or uh, yeah, hyponatremia is your diarrhea, like what this child had. The other causes are diuretics. Okay? And the other two important causes, one is cerebral salt wasting syndrome and the other one is your mineral corticoid deficiency. Like I said, nephrotic syndrome, heart failure, and liver disease are typical examples of um, hypervolemic or edematous state and um, hypovolemia. Now, uh, urine sodium is um, something that we do. And remember, in hypovolemic state, in hypovolemic state, urine, urine sodium will be less than 20 which means uh, the kidneys are working at their best to conserve all the sodium possible. So, so let's just remember that. So if you apply that in hypovolemic hyponatremia due to um, uh, GI losses, the urine sodium will be low. But when the, in the other conditions, there is an exception to this rule, to the general rule where the urine sodium will be low, less than 20 in hypovolemic state. So just make a note of that here. However, urine sports sodium has limited value for some reason. Number one, it never gets collected in children. And number two, uh, the pre-existent sodium intake of the child may be variable. So that is another fact. And many times normal saline gets started. But it's a good exercise to try and collect uh, uh, urine samples for sports sodium. Now, how will you treat this child. Um, again, uh, keep your treatment simple, uh, step simple, correct shock, fluid bolus must be administered. So this child is uh, compensated shock. Um, so if, uh, and it's hypovolemic shock. So you can give 20 ml per kilo of normal saline over 20 to 30 minutes. And then since uh, we already saw this is acute symptomatic hyponatremia, and uh, so you should use 3 ml. It's very low, less than 120. So uh, use 3% saline. Uh, remember, one, the dose of three per 1 to 3 mils per kilo. 1 ml per kilo, kilo will raise the sodium by 1 millimoles. So you can calculate. So the dose may be repeated. And the usual endpoint to give a bolus of normal saline for treating hyponatremia is either the symptoms, okay, either the symptoms resolve, or you aim for a change in the sodium, not too much, huh? four, four to six. Um, or you can aim for a plasma sodium or 20, 125. In this child, you can even sort of target even lower sodium because here there is a possibility that the hyponatremia can be chronic as well. Of course, start antibiotics and uh, in depletional hyponatremia, usually if you correct the volume, if you just uh, treat the volume, uh, correct the volume and plan your IV fluids correctly, often the sodium gets corrected. And always remember, avoid a rapid rise of, to avoid administering too, too a rapid rise of normalization of sodium. Uh, central pontine myelinosis is reported due to rapid correction. However, in children, it's not very common or maybe we haven't uh, searched for it hard enough. Um, the clinical features and treatment of hyponatremia depends on two factors. And you must remember that one is the level of sodium and the second one is the rapidity of fall. Um, so level of sodium, usually we take 120. Okay, one, so the less than 120 symptoms are likely. However, though, acute fall. Acute fall children also tend to become symptomatic. And sometimes even a fall from 128 to say of 124, if it's very acute, they can become uh, symptomatic. Chronic hyponatremia are so well compensated. So they don't have symptoms. However, though, uh, and that is because the brain adapts by generating idiogenic uh, osmosis. But you must remember when you correct chronic hyponatremia with the ra rapid correction, they run into trouble. Okay. So, so acute fall, are likely to be symptomatic, but uh, chronic are, are less likely to be symptomatic, but these children run into trouble when you, when you correct the sodium. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, case, which is, uh, which is in the PICU. This is a 16 year old girl. She has underwent a spinal uh, fusion procedure, complicated surgery by fantastic uh, spinal um, uh, orthopedic team. She's fine and her temperature is all right. Um, heart rate is uh, 82, her respiratory rate is 18. Blood pressure is 110 by 68, SPO2 is 97. Her labs come, a routine uh, post-operative bloods come that her sodium is 125, her potassium is 3.5, chloride is okay, creatinine is 0.3 and osmolality is low, 258. 
Now, on a second post-op day, the urine output is noted to decrease from 1.5 mils per kg per hour to 0.2 mils per kg per hour. Now, what are your thoughts? Of course, the first uh, thing comes to your mind will be, oh, is the patient having acute renal failure? And it's not uncommon to administer a fluid bolus to this patient. Now, let's see if the urine output picks up. But all, also consider the possibility of SIADH here. So this is a typical scenario of um, syndrome of inappropriate ADH common. This is one of the most common cause of hyponatremia in children in ICU. Um, so uh, we cannot measure uh, ADH. Uh, ADH is not measurable. Uh, but a high ADH or inappropriate secretion of ADH results in, um, in the reabsorption of water that would normally be excreted in the urine by kidney. So uh, SIADH is actually a disorder of water, okay, impaired free water excretion. It is actually a disorder of water, water problem, but we recognize it or we see it as a sodium problem. Okay. So there are supporting evidences are, uh, so like I said, ADH hormone is not measurable. And even if it is measurable, it is very sensitive. So you cannot interpret it in clinical terms. You'll have to look for other evidences. So the osmolarity will be low here, like a true hyponatremia. Urine output will be low. Then the other supporting evidences, if you manage to collect a urine spot sodium and a urine osmolarity, uh, so urine spot sodium will be high because, not because it's a problem of uh, sodium excretion, but because it's a very concentrated urine, so the patient is not excreting enough free water. And the osmolality also will be 150. Textbooks say if the urine osmolality in this scenario is more than 150, it's almost conclusive of SIADH. And other additional supporting evidences are low uric acid and low blood urea nitrogen. Okay, and this euvolemic hyponatremia accounts for 60% of all hyponatremia. So the treatment is different. It is the must restrict fluids and may try loop diuretics. If you keep giving sodium, the hyponatremia will actually worsen. Okay, so it's important to recognize this. Now, scenario five is a post-operative surgical patients in the neurosurgical uh, ICU. Uh, this is a child with uh, TB meningitis, has underwent a VP shunt, and then is noticed to have urine output high, 4 ml per kg per hour, and the sodium is low. Okay, so what are the possibilities? So here, this is a typical example of cerebral salt wasting. So hyponatremia with high urine output. Um, and if you do an urine osmolarity and urine spot sodium, so here the urine sodium excretion will be very high, okay, so 60 and above, and very high urine osmolarity. So the etiology of this condition is not known, but there is a lot of interest in the neurosurgical uh, field in this uh, condition. So this is called cerebral salt wasting. The hyponatremia is hypovolemic or depletional. Remember the first column. Okay, so urine spot sodium here will be very high, above 60, and uh, very high osmolality, very because uh, because the child just wastes uh, the waste salt. So SIADH and cerebral salt wasting both are seen in uh, post-operative conditions and in neurosurgical IC uh, in in neuro, in, in post-operative uh, situations. So how do we differentiate? Okay, so the serum sodium will be low in both conditions. Remember that both are high, cause hyponatremia. Okay, the serum osmolality will be low in both conditions because they both are true hyponatremia. Okay. But the differences are the volume status. SIADH, the volume status will be normal or they are slightly edematous. In cerebral salt wasting, they are hypovolemic or dehydrated. Urine output will be normal or low in SIADH, whereas in CSW, uh, the vol uh, there will be polyuria. Okay? And uh, urine spot sodium, like I said, in SIADH, it will be a bit high, not, uh, about 40, but in cerebral salt wasting, it will be very high. Uh, blood urea and uric acid will be low, will be low in SIADH, but will be high, like a dehydration no? like in uh, this thing. Same thing with the urea creatinine ratio. So, so that sort of concludes our discussion on hyponatremia. So approach to step one, establish if it is real, rule out sampling error. In step two, check osmolarity if it is possible. If it is not possible, take a look at your sugars, protein, triglycerides, and that should be helpful. Step three, 
assess the volume status and that is done no easy uh, um, no easy method you have to just go through the history diarrhea examination uh, urine output what is the type and volume of uh, put everything together and then come to a conclusion and that needs practice and then try to assert and get step 4 and 5 will be if you can collect a urine sample and send for urine osmolality and urine spot sodium like i said it is gives a bit of variable result but you can try this if it's over 150 it may suggest siadh if it is urine spot sodium is less than 20 suggest hypovolemia in cerebral salt wasting it will be very high because it is salt wasting condition and in siadh usually it will be a bit over 40 then step 6 before you jump in and treat think if the so if the think is it acute or chronic remember acute uh, you can treat but chronic be very very careful because these childs are compensated and if you administer if you bring the sodium too fast the child your patient will run into trouble okay so and whatever it is remember not to correct more than 0.5 millimoles per kg per hour okay so now next scenario is a newborn who is a 14 day old neonate uh, the baby was born had born beautifully 3 kilo good size baby normal vaginal delivery goes home comes back on 14th day with oh, lethargy dehydration and had lost weight to about 2.2 kg so the bloods are okay but the sodium has come as 196 potassium is 5.4 Uh, bicarb is low mild acidosis creat is 3.92 and calcium is 7 so guess the, the blood sugar is also high i think you must have guessed the diagnosis so this infant is again a commonly seen in pediatric practice um, hypernatremic dehydration and uh, this is due to breastfeeding related so this is called breastfeeding hyponatremia and uh, acute uh, or acute kidney injury or now yeah it is called pre renal the pre renal term is no longer used anyway and uh, so what is what has caused hyponatremia in this baby so there are some factors that predisposed this baby to develop hyponatremia and some of them are physiological neonates have high insensible water loss they have a uh, higher water loss both uh, through all three modes uh, conductive and evaporative losses are high in babies because of the thin skin and their kidneys are not mature they have poor renal concentrating ability so they tend to lose more water and that is why neonatal uh, iv fluid planning will be higher than um your uh, for uh, what we do for children and here the ins uh, insufficient intake uh, because primary mothers it's a condition that is seen in uh, primary mothers due to uh, unknown factors somehow the breastfeeding fails and and with these uh, kind of additional factors the baby develops hypernatremic dehydration um what are the abnormalities of present in this infant so just make a note there is mild acidosis probably related to uh, the um, renal failure and uh, calcium is low and make a note of the rbs blood sugar is high here and remember here glucose is an effective osmol so here it is better to not treat the blood sugar sometimes uh, my fellows ask oh should i give insulin to bring it down uh, i think it is safer to not bring it down because here it might be exerting an osmotic effect and protecting the brain um so uh, unless there is ketosis the uh, ketosis you are safer uh, by not treating the blood sugar too uh, rapidly okay so the definition of hypernatremia is uh, sodium more than uh, 150 and severe hypernatremia is more than 170 hypernatremia is associated with 15 times higher mortality than in those hospitalized children with no hypernatremia so remember that and this mortality comes from both the effect of hypernatremia and the effect of Uh, treatment so it's like double edged sword if you if you if you go on this side also it's problem if you fall, if fall on that side also the infant sometime run into trouble and that's because hypernatremia uh, draws fluid uh, from the cells into the ecf compartment um so there is intracellular dehydration and as a result the brain kind of shrinks and that sort of stretches and 
uh, stretches your bridging veins in between that can cause cerebral hemorrhage and it is for this reason that uh, in newborn babies we teach to avoid uh, uh, bicarb pushes because the surges in uh, sodium can sometimes cause intraventricular uh, bleed in newborns uh, which can be devastating Okay, so this is another 10-month-old infant with large watery stools and vomiting for two days. Mother has been giving ORS huh, packet. She, she took the instruction wrongly and she's dissolving one packet of ORS in one cup instead of one liter. So the infant comes two days later. She's lethargic, very high-pitched, shrill cry, tachycardic, hypotensive, sunken fontanel, and doughy skin. Uh, the labs saw the sodium to be 178. So this is an example of another example of hypernatremic dehydration. So diarrhea dehydration is a common problem in infants. 70% of those children will develop isotonic dehydration. That means their water loss and electrolyte loss are on par. A small proportion, 20% of children will develop hyponatremic dehydration. Another smaller percent, 10% will develop hypernatremic dehydration. Okay, so the uh, additional uh, uh, factor is inappropriate ORS, which must have contributed to the hypernatremia in this infant. Okay, so the other causes are um, children who are developmentally challenged, elderly people. Uh, so they have limited thirst and sometimes even if they are thirsty, they may not have access to water. So that is another group that is risk for developing um, hypernatremic dehydration. Concentrated milk formula, artificially fit. So that is another risk factor. And of course, your summer months, we had a recent infant who developed diarrhea while on a train, sleeper class from Bihar to Vellore during the month of uh, uh, May. And uh, if the infant develops uh, diarrhea, maybe there was not enough access to water and uh, high insensible loss. And the infant came with a uh, so sodium of 196 by the time the child reached Bellor. Um, so this is another neurosurgical patient, traumatic head injury, child is intubated, ventilated, again high urine output, but here the sodium is high, unlike the other patient with the cerebral salt wasting where the sodium is low. So here there is hypernatremia. So polyuria plus hypernatremia in a neurosurgical patient is suggestive of diabetes insipidus. Okay. So these are all some of the cause, common causes of hypernatremia. So let's just classify the, uh, them into three groups. The first group they have is increased sodium intake. Okay, with no. So and the typical examples are iatrogenic, okay, soda bicarb, 3% saline, uh, giving inappropriate ORS. So these are the common examples. And the second clause is when there is free water exit. That means um, they lose too much water. And therefore, they become hypernatremic. And the third group is they have deficits of both water and sodium. However, the loss of water is more than the loss of sodium. Okay, so clinical features, uh, let's just quickly see. Shock occurs, the dehydration. But in hypernatremic dehydration, dehydration tends to be underestimated. And that's because of the relatively preserved ECF. So because sodium is high, therefore water moves from uh, intracellular. So there is more severe dehydration in the intracellular compartment, whereas the ECF is relatively preserved. And, uh, and that's why the doughy consistency of skin is typical of hypernatremic dehydration. Okay. Um, so the general principles of management of hypernatremic dehydration are step one, if the child is shocked, recognize shock and treat shock. There is no two ways about it with the saline. Step two will be you'll have to plan the fluid correction and that the principle is aim to lower the sodium at no more than 10 to 12 millicolons in 24 hours. Okay, so that's 0.5 millicolons per hour. Step three, must monitor. So you cannot write the fluid. So often they need six hourly or eight hourly monitoring of sodium. Keep an eye on the hydration state, the neurological state and urine output. So they need more closer monitoring. Make adjustments. If your sodium is falling uh, too low, um, then you have to um, increase the fluid rate. But if it is think too much, no, per hour you can calculate every hour how much, and that then you have to adjust the IV fluid rate. Okay. If there are neurological symptoms, you can uh, consider infusion of three percent saline. Okay. And if there are any underlying conditions, recognize them and treat them. 
So the formula for correcting uh, hyponatremia, the one formula is your free water deficit, which is more practice in the adult uh, adult world uh, by the nephrologist. Um, uh, it is given in your textbooks, but it is not commonly uh, practiced. What we follow is a method too, where uh, we estimate the correction. You usually take it as 10% correction, and then you calculate the maintenance fluid for 48 or 72 hours. And that whether it's 48 hours or 72 hours depends upon your initial sodium, where you begin with. And uh, usually you start with the uh, isotonic saline, and then you can titrate it. Maybe you can just drop it to plasma light as the sodium slowly drops. So the fluid rate and type depends upon your initial serum sodium. Let's just move on to potassium. So potassium is a prominent intracellular ion, cation. So potassium disturbances are also common. Um, so, so this is a, in the pediatric wards. It's a two-month-old infant boy with a VST. Uh, he has viral URI and V's. He's uh, got uh, respiratory distress and was noticed to have some V's. And some kind resident has started the infant on salbutamol nebulization. And they, he's also on digoxin and furosemide. So on usual routine electrolytes, the potassium has come as 2.5. So now what do I do? Um, okay, so let's just look at first what must have contributed or what must have caused this hypokalemia in this uh, infant. Um, so again, uh, these are simple uh, logical reasoning, nothing uh, rocket science. Uh, one is furosemide uh, causes increased excretion of potassium in the urine, and that is uh, complemented or contributed by your salbutamol nebulizations. Um, of course, the infant has distress, and therefore uh, oral intake uh, will be less, and therefore that could have contributed. Okay, but what are the concerns here? So the concerns is the hypokalemia in, free, uh, in a child with uh, cardiovascular heart disease increases your risk of complications, so which makes it complicated uh, in this scenario. Okay, and hypokalemia definitely potentiates your digoxin toxicity. Okay, so what is the definition of hypokalemia? The normal value is 3.5 to 5. Hypokalemia is defined as value below 3.5. And then you can classify it into mild, moderate, severe. Mild is 3.5, all are 0.5. So 3 to 3.5. Moderate should be 2.5 to 3, sorry. And severe is 2.5. Generally, symptoms don't become manifest until the serum potassium is below 3. So often it, uh, 3, 3.2 like that gets picked up incidentally uh, when an electrolyte is checked. And many times uh, and uh, is, is checked on a routine basis. So remember, so that's mild hypokalemia, uh, usually or not symptomatic. And it is more of a lab. Um, it gets picked up on routine labs. Okay. Why, how does salbutamol causes um, hypokalemia. So for that, you have to understand the intracellular movements of potassium. So your cells have your ATP pump, the, which pumps out sodium and pumps in potassium. And uh, salbutamol, adrenaline, these are beta agonists. And so they, um, they augment the action of this pump. And therefore, they cause intracellular movement of potassium. Um, salbutamol, adrenaline, insulin, and alkalosis. On the opposite side, acidosis. Acidosis will cause the potassium to move out of the uh, cells. Okay, so that's uh, simple. So alkalosis um, will move um, potassium inside. Okay, so that is, remember one thing. And the second thing is potassium intake. Uh, potassium is actually quite uh, plentifully available in most diets. So if you are taking normal diet, it's very unlikely uh, to be the cause of hypokalemia, except in malnutrition, malnourished child. So the other cause is increased loss. And the loss can be GI or it can be in the, um, in the renal. So GI losses, uh, the re so GI losses again, um, not very common, but more commonly renal losses. So renal losses you see in renal tubular acidosis, in DKA because of osmolarity, uh, post-obstructive diuresis, 
uh, hypoagnesemia, magnesemia. Amphoterism is notorious to cause hypokalemia, and the hypokalemia can be really, really difficult to treat, and of course, your diuretic use. Um, and remember, the uh, urinary excretion is tied to aldosterone. Aldosterone will increase your potassium excretion and also alkalosis. So that's why alkalosis, alkal metabolic alkalosis children are often hypokalemic, and it again can be really, sometimes you have to correct the potassium, and then only your alkalosis will improve. So clinical manifestations, uh, like I said, over three and above are not symptomatic. Below three can be associated with symptoms, and the symptoms are muscle weakness, paralysis, ileus, arrhythmias. Uh, polyuria is often uh, uh, another accompaniment of hypokalemia. Sometimes they can cause ECG changes are quite characteristics um, or uh, theoretically, you know, if you read every book, uh, the ECG changes are pretty standard. So flat, the T wave flattens, T wave, and then uh, ST depression and U wave. However, if you ask clinicians, apparently it doesn't really correlate. You can hardly, if you, if you think back, you know, many, most of us have not really recognized hypokalemia from the ECG. And that's the, um, that's the experience of others as well. But hypokalemia, remember, can cause arrhythmias. Both hypo-hyperkalemias can cause or are important causes of sudden cardiac arrest in the in critically ill children. Okay. So treatment of hypokalemia can be oral or IV. Oral route is always safe and best and preferred for potassium three over three. If it's over three and the child is well, you can just ask them to take more potassium containing uh, fluids or you can just prescribe oral KCL for a short duration and, and leave it at that. Um, oral KCL is a bit bitter. It doesn't taste all that great and can cause gastric irritation. Uh, one ml of uh, KCL gives 1.3 milliequivalents of potassium. So you can calculate in milliequivalents and then convert it into how much mil of syrup you need to give. Um, you can increase in the hospitalized patient, you can add IV maintenance and uh, you calculate one to two milliequivalents per kg. Remember, one gram of KCL gives 13 milliequivalents or millimoles. They both are same. Um, and there is a maximum concentration is 40 milliequivalents per liter. That is three grams. One gram is 13. Um, so three grams will have 39 milliequivalents. So that's a maximum per liter uh, that you can give as maintenance uh, in a peripheral line. And also try to prescribe uh, potassium in terms of grams, like 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75 by one gram. So that's a common clinical practice. And this is to avoid uh, errors in uh, uh, making potassium. Rapid IV correction is commonly used in uh, ICUs. You need to have rhythm monitoring. And the dose is 0.4 into weight into 4 into weight milliequivalents over four hours. Rapid correction is used if the potassium is less than 2.5 generally. When you write potassium, always remember or beware of prescription errors. So be double check with your colleague. And it is a good practice to have two people writing the orders and two people checking potassium um, uh, loading the action. And always be conservative. Okay, when you give potassium. So remember these uh, tips. Sometimes you find potassium, you're giving 2.4 and then you've given potassium and the potassium comes up to 2.4. Another potassium correction and the potassium still stays 2.5. And with the third potassium correction, the potassium shoots up to uh, five. So I don't know whether you've noticed, but if you have noticed it, this, this is the explanation. This graph shows the relation between body potassium and your serum potassium, and that is not linear. It follows this pattern. So that is because potassium is mostly intracellular and it's contained in your muscle. So first your body potassium has to be replenished, and then the serum potassium goes. And because of this phenomenon, sometimes you find this. So just, just so you know, um, uh, this uh, what I'll show you. Going on to hyperkalemia. So hyperkalemia definition is more than 5.5. So normal potassium is 3.5 to 5.5. Uh, hyperkalemia is over 5.5. In preterms and young infants, you can see potassium up to 6.5. Just remember that don't rush into treat. And uh, that is because um, uh, young infants, newborns, have reduced urinary potassium excretion because of their relative uh, uh, insensitivity to aldosterone and also because of the low GFR. Okay. 
Yeah? So, so just remember that. And also remember that plasma value and serum value differ by uh, 0.3 millimoles. So serum value will be higher because uh, in the lab, in biochemistry, uh, the, for serum value, you have to clot first you have to get, and then the serum is taken. And in that process, there is some potassium that comes out. So serum value will be higher. So your ABG machine runs your plasma. So that will be 0.3 less. So remember that very often you find out oh, this is not correlating. So that is normal. Both values are okay. Uh, you'll have to take it at their uh, face value. So causes of hyperkalemia, we won't go into details, but rule out spurious value, hemolysis, too tight tunicate. So just the, once you've ruled out, then think, is there any increased intake of potassium? For example, what is the IV potassium patient is getting? Is there any blood transfusion? And uh, so look into that. Once then done, then the third important cause is transcellular shifts. So just like uh, for potassium, Always remember transcellular shifts. So acidosis, like I said, can cause hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is also seen in conditions like rhabdomyolysis and tumor lysis, uh, succinylcholine. Severe exercise sometimes can cause osmolarity also can cause uh, hyperkalemia. And then finally, is the patient having defective excretion of potassium? And the typical example is renal failure. Um, and when you treat hyperkalemia, again, consider three things. One is the level of potassium. Like I said, potassium hyperkalemia is 5.5 uh, to 6 is mild, 6 to 6.9 is moderate, and over 7 is severe. Okay. And also think, what is the rapidity of increase? Is it going to increase further? In a patient with renal failure, it's likely to increase more. But if you have a patient with acidosis, if you correct acidosis, uh, it's likely the potassium will drop. So keep that also in the back of your mind when you make management decisions. And of course, ECG changes. So ECG changes of hyperkalemia, you have to memorize. Um, so the first change is in the T waves, tall T wave, and then uh, the PR interval prolongs. And that is followed by widening of the QRS complex. And then, of course, uh, then the P wave becomes flat. So tall T wave followed by prolonged PR interval, wide QRS complex. Then the P wave becomes flat. And then that kind of looks like a sine wave. And then finally, arrhythmias appear. So again, remember both hyper and hypokalemias are causes of sudden, they are preventable causes of sudden cardiac arrest. So um, just to remember mnemonic, to remember uh, your uh, ECG changes. So um, this is another push and pull in uh, in emergency and intensive care. So in hyperkalemia, it's almost it's like the T wave is pulled up, whereas in hypokalemia, it's like if you push your T wave in. So it is T wave inversion and ST depression, whereas here it is uh, peaked T waves and uh, PR prolongation. Okay. Okay, treatment of hyperkalemia is must memorize. You just have to memorize it. You cannot look up because it is. So let's just quickly run through the drugs. Uh, calcium, first drug is calcium gluconate, 10%. The dose is 0.5 to 1 mil per kilo, maximum 20 mil. It stabilizes cardiac cell membrane. The onset of action is immediate. And uh, uh, but it is short lived. So you may want, you can repeat if it is needed. So consider repeat doses. Um, glucose insulin uh, uh, dextrose infusion, uh, the dose is 0.1 units of atropid, maximum 10 units, and it is put in uh, like your hypoglycemia dose, uh, 5 ml per kg of 10% dextrose or 2 ml per kilo of 25% dextrose. It shifts potassium into the cells. Uh, the onset of action is 10 to 20 minutes and peaks 20 to 30 minutes and uh, hypoglycemia uh, can happen. So it's important to check a sugar one hour later. Uh, salbutamol nebulization is 2.5 milligram for those less than 25, 5 milligram over 25 and 10 milligram over 50 kilo. Make it up to 4 ml saline and nebulizes. This also shifts potassium into the cell. And the action is immediate drop, it seems. And uh, the drop of uh, studies have demonstrated 1 to 1.5 milliequivalents drop, which is very significant and life-saving, isn't it? And within an hour. And another advantage of giving salbutamol nebs is it can be useful if no IV access available. Even before you start IV access, you can start salbutamol nebulization. It can be used as an alternative or it can be given concomitantly or sequentially with your GK insulin. So it's a good idea to start. Remember that. 
uh, don't have to wait gk insulin then you wait so you can be started concomitantly or even even mdis can be used salvetamol okay soda bicarb is um, one milliequivalent per kilo uh, it alters the ph and it is uncertain if it is beneficial then you have your kx silate or sodium polystyrene sulfonate it exchanges exchanges so potassium for sodium and the dose is 1 gram per kg uh, every 4 hours it's given either you can give it to the ng or into the retention edema okay it is not useful in emergent situation okay and uh, and i did and it is more useful for moderate um, hyperkalemia for persistent action so more uh, more like a subsequent sort of uh, thing not so much in thing and uh, it used to be mixed in sorbit sorbitol but now that is not recommended because some colonic perforations have been recommended so now you can use either lactose or puritan dextrose and keep so you can have some algorithm for your practice for your practical decisions so hyperkalemia is defined as potassium over 5.5 first step stop all potassium supplementation check medications and put the patient on cardiac monitoring okay so you've done that and of course exclude your venous sample um, or hemolyzed sample make sure that it is true value and then your algorithm splits into severe hyperkalemia like if your potassium is more than 7 then the patient is likely to need dialysis if you don't have facilities you may consider thinking or transferring your pa patient to the tertiary center and while you are doing that you can try the other uh, other mod modalities of treatment calcium salbutamol gk bicarb and uh, kx late okay uh, if it is between moderate like between 6 and 7 and the patient is asymptomatic and ecg is normal you can start the standard therapy salbutamol lab glucose Uh, insulin uh, etc um if it is between 5.5 and 6 and the patient is asymptomatic ecg is normal uh, for mild hyperkalemia then you want to you can consider if treatment is necessary or if the patient is just getting extra potassium you can stop and watch maybe in that situation salbutamol neb probably will be the best uh, approach and you can maintain your patient on uh, kxlet okay This case moves to uh, post-operative cardiac ICU. This is a boy with a tetralogy of phallo. He has underwent cardiac repair, and his calcium comes as 0.92. Okay, so um, calcium, of course, is important for uh, for cardiac function. And um, so calcium normal value is 8.5 to 10, and it exists in two forms. Huh? Nearly about half half is found as uh, Um, half of it, uh, for 55, is ionized calcium. The ionized calcium is important because that is free and physiological active. The for 40% is protein bound. Um, so when you have calcium level, you must consider two factors: pH and albumin. Okay. pH acidosis can increase your ionized fraction, and therefore it will prevent your patient from symptomatic because ionized calcium is the one that is physiologically active. Um, so you can work out if you like but but just remember that um albumin will decrease your protein bound calcium so um so uh, so your total calcium may be normal may be okay your in the presence of hypoalbuminemia uh, the albumin found bound fraction will be low and therefore uh, for a given total calcium the patient may be having ionized calcium for example the nephrotic syndrome boy with a calcium of 7 his albumin is low and uh, therefore he'll have more ionized calcium which also has some protective effect so you can correct the calcium by using a factor of 0.8 for every gram of albumin uh, low from 4 uh, so you can work it out treatment of hypocalcemia uh, for acute life threatening hypocalcemia and that is ionized calcium less than 0.9 or if it is symptomatic or total calcium less than 7 okay you give injection calcium gluconate is commonly used that has 10% solution uh, so 100 to 200 mg or 1 to 2 ml per kg of 10% solution it has to be diluted to equal volume of 5 or 10% dextrose because calcium is irritant to the iv line and when you are giving you must give it uh, slowly watch for extravasation and watch for bradycardia calcium effects are transient for 2 to 4 hours so you have to uh, maintain calcium there are two ways of doing it either repeat uh, repeat boluses every 6 hours which is commonly practiced uh, in our in our department 
or the other option will be to add it to the maintenance iv the problem of adding to the maintenance iv is that because uh, because of the fear of extravasation um uh, and and therefore it is a bit of worry because if it extravasates and then uh, the damage is done and therefore whereas if you're giving slow iv bolus at least somebody is watching it and and that's the reason for giving iv uh, boluses but in icu sometimes we do run iv calcium infusion preferably into a central vein oral calcium is available many salts are available all standard doses you can look up calcium is available as calcium carbonate calcium um, lactate acetate uh, gluconate and uh, this is the dose for calcium gluconate uh, many time we have to add rocaltrot because vitamin d deficiency is also common usually it is uh, 0.25 microgram uh, per kg and that's the smallest down it is used to bring up calcium levels quickly Uh, so that they are not symptomatic and usually it's enough to give the rocaltrot for about 3 to 4 days rocaltrot is the active form of vitamin d3 125 and then you change over to the ordinary form the vitamin d3 the inactive form of the calcerol granules um, uh, can it can be changed over there uh, all remember and to treat magnesium deficiency magnesium hypomagnesemia can cause hypocalcemia calcium chloride has higher uh, calcium content but it is acidic and it can cause acidosis acidosis and it is not freely available so therefore uh, we don't use uh, calcium chloride ecg changes of hypocalcemia are interesting it prolongs qt interval so qt interval is from beginning of q till end of t and uh, corrected you have to correct it to the variable rr interval usually so that is called corrected qtc so uh, you take the qt interval and divide it by the root of rr and uh, qtc interval is 440 milliseconds uh, 0.4 so hypocalcemia prolongs qt interval and that can produce post to arrhythmias there are some syndromes associated which you can look up there is a recommendation in uh, sepsis um, surviving sepsis campaign with regard to calcium and uh, some a lot of these a lot of members actually do target uh, normal calcium and some said that they target normal calcium in those patients with septic shock and who are dependent or who are on vasoactive infusions um so magnesium uh, causes secondary hypocalcemia uh, and that is through your action uh, magnesium's action on ph uh, on pth parathyroid hormone so magnesium impairs the release of parathyroid hormone and blunts your tissue response to para, para pth and can cause hypocalcemia so dose you can look up magnesium is also used in asthma tetanus it has been a game game changer in tetanus and also in pulmonary hypertension so this arrhythmia is um, uh tosed is the point is no clear polymorphic ventricular tachycardia where and uh, for this uh, you have to use uh, magnesium injection is the only treatment So we had a 12 year old child with the Guillain-Barré syndrome she has been intubated ventilated for 2 months tracheal tube was placed she has been doing okay and she was being weaned off ventilator and suddenly the calcium someone had checked and the calcium level has come as 11.2 okay other electrolytes were normal and she was intermittently complaining of uh, nausea and some pain so what should we do so calcium again so, um, hypercalcemia is uh, anything over 10.5 10.5 to 12 is mild 12 to 14 is moderate and over 14 patient can develop hypercalcemic crisis so the cause for the in this patient is prolonged immobilization other causes are uh, parathyroidism hyperparathyroidism excessive vitamin d okay and some malignant disorders huh, with uh, malignant bone reabsorption and uh, some uh, thyroid diuretics can sometimes cause and of course other endocrine disorders so these are some of the causes of hypercalcemia the problem with calcium is the its effects on uh, co- of causing tissue calci- calcification and uh, nephrocalcinosis uh, it shortens your qt interval and uh, with calcium remember your undergraduate you know stones bones groans and overtones psychiatric overtones is a mnemonic to remember uh, symptoms of hypercalcemia hypercalcemia the calcification is supposed to first occur in the conjunctiva it seems so the first symptom patient can have is a irritant feeling in the uh, conjunctiva treatment is uh, hydration uh, loop diuretic steroids is a kind of is a good uh, good handy agent to treat hypercalcemia in your patient uh it inhibits uh, it acts through your vitamin d metabolism 
it inhibits conversion to calcium and of course biphosphonates calcitonin and in a very rare cases uh, dialysis have to go uh, we just have two patients uh, of uh, hyperphosphatemia i think uh, you should be familiar with this hyperphosphatemia we see with uh, commonly with uh, children with chronic kidney disease because of excessive absorption phosphate apparently is abundant in your diet and therefore in chronic kidney disease they have defective excretion um in infants late onset hypocalcemia that is also due to high phosphate load in the cow's milk we had a recent infant who came with seizures and got uh, intubated and then it turns out that the mother was covid positive and therefore isolated and the baby was fed on cow's milk calcium was 5.5 and potassium was uh, 6.3 um the baby did have a stomach cause uh, in the icu so uh, leukemia and uh, x ray like that i think you've guessed it so this is a case of uh, tumor lysis so the electrolyte abnormalities in tumor lysis are hyperuricemia hypophosphatemia hypocalcemia and hyperkalemia okay so um so hypophosphatemia is a um, normal value of phosphate is 2.5 to 4.5 it's not very common but it it's important while you are treating children with dk because again uh, it can cause if there is transcellular shift and the phosphate phosphate can sometime drop dangerously low and uh, uh, we have to use potassium phosphate instead of potassium chloride it is available but not freely available outside just remember that when you are treating children with dka sometimes you can run into trouble with severe hypophosphatemia uh, severe hypophosphatemia can cause rhabdomyolysis and an icu implication is it can cause delay in weaning off ventilator and uh, refeeding syndrome is another uh, problem that we see with hypophosphatemia a quick word about albumin mm. so albumin is uh, colloid and it is very effective in um, expanding the intravascular volume okay so albumin versus colloids has been debated over half a century um, but uh, crystalloids are the fluid of choice in in resuscitation so the role of albumin comes subsequently uh, we have 5% and 20% albumin and 5% albumin can be used for uh, intra for as a fluid bolus in hypovolemic or intravascular depleted patients uh, 20% albumin should not be infused uh, for volume replacement remember that but it can be used slowly the dose is 0.5 to 1 g per kg and usually we give it as an infusion over 24 hours sometimes this albumin is uh, combined with uh, diuretic as used for your late uh, fluid removal therapy um and there are advantages in combining albumin with lasix because albumin improves the intravascular volume and therefore it improves delivery of the loop, uh, loop diuretics into the site of secretions and therefore the combination is uh, useful and uh, final word uh, always whenever the patient is ready in the uh, ready uh, you must switch to enteral nutrition Uh, early enteral nutrition promotes gi mucosal integrity and function causes fewer infections better healing and overall improved short and long term goals so every opportunity to feed you must feed your uh, critically ill children that's a simple uh, parental nutrition is quite expensive for us and um, uh, infection rates are phenomenally high with uh, near tpn so i have to conclude now now all these cases you know electrolyte disturbances are all around you so learn to recognize and with modern abg machines just in one panel you actually get all electrolytes is actually much cheaper and it is a good idea at all secondary level hospitals to have abg machines and um, uh, many companies are willing to offer a machine just for the cartridge charges you have to pay so that has brought the cost down and it is available as point of care uh, test and when you are treating treat patient not just get the numbers right and sometime your patient will run you would have corrected the numbers but patient will run into trouble and uh, always have acceptable values what is acceptable rather than normal uh, values and uh, remember the four uh, d's and thank you and sorry it's become a bit long lecture thank you uh, deepika over to you yes thank you so much ma'am i mean uh, there were few buzzing words uh, which you said i think 
we all uh, must take with us today. That is, we can't just prescribe fluids and walk away. I mean, that's just very, very important. We need to uh, review them every six hours, eight hours, and uh, make sure that what we are doing is all right, and then it's um, good for the patient. And again, 40s, again, that's another one, which I think uh, take home message. Um, so there are a few questions on the chat, or if someone wants to uh, unmute and ask anything, then I'll go ahead with the questions on the chat. There are lots of compliments, ma'am. So uh, Peter has put a yeah, compliment as well as he asked one question. Uh, so hypernatremia as a poor prognostic uh, marker. That I would like to answer. Uh, so what's the question? Hyponatremia as a poor prognostic marker. Um, I don't think you should understand hyponatremia as a poor prognostic matter. It is common, I think, in uh, children, and it is uh, um, it should be recognized. I, I, I'm not sure. Hyponatremia has been has been. Uh, said he has mentioned in adult COVID. In the adult, huh? they have noticed with the uh, IL six as a severity mass marker when the cytokine storm. And okay. by that time, that hyponatremia, that's what I think Peter is mentioning, but not in our uh, situation. I'm not sure, Peter. If, yeah. Yeah. And there is one another about um, oral potassium correction. Is there a role for? Uh, oral, there is oral, a role for? Uh, oral, salt, oral salt for hyponatremia correction. Uh, oral potassium, yes, oral uh, oral potassium correction uh, does have a good role because it is safer and preferred. Um, however, I'm not sure the availability, how it is available outside. And also that can I be think, a problem. And also, I think um, it's very important to know the hypotonicity of this potassium solution. So we need to make sure we are giving one is to three ratio, either breast milk or whichever feeds. Sometimes it's one ml, and then practically giving that yeah. is also very important yeah. um, to make sure the nurses are giving it with some feeds, mm -hmm. isn't it? Because otherwise they are giving yeah. drugs with. Uh, so yeah, so mm. so I'm not sure about the availability of uh, potassium chloride. We regularly, routinely use uh, oral KCL. Uh, there was a time when patients were on digoxin, Lasix, and KCL as a combo. <laughs> Uh, the thing with the use of digoxin has come down now, so oral KCL use also has uh, has dropped, and patient people are not very familiar with oral uh, KCL. Um, it's about enteral nutrition, something there, no, Deepika? Yeah, I think the question is about is there a role for oral salt for hyponatremia correction? So I think uh, Senthil is trying to ask whether. Do we have sodium supplements orally? Is what I, I reckon the question is. Sodium supplement. Oh, sodium supplement is just uh, for salt that we take, sodium chloride. Is there an option yes. for us to ask yes. a direct question? Yes, please. Uh, um, very good afternoon, Madam. Sendil here from Madurai. Uh, hope all are doing fine. Hi, Sendil. Uh, that, was, Hi, yeah, that was my question regarding the oral common salt for hyponatremic correction. Sometimes once into enteral feeding, the sodium bound to be around 130, 128, and we try to yeah. correct the sodium through oral common salt. And sometimes we find it very difficult to do that. Uh, your experience, and if there is any uh, prescription sort of uh, dosage. I think if you can give uh, sodium uh, oral as uh, so oral sodium, I think it is good. It's uh, safe and simple. Uh, you can add it to the milk, um, and especially for the low, uh, I mean, in the sort of in the range of sodium 130. So like that, high, the IV sodium is only to treat acute symptomatic and uh, hyposodium below 120. Rest of the sodiums can be managed with oral sodium. Okay. Uh, we do gain like this uh, salt, extra salt only. I don't think there is a 
commercial available anything you are asking that sort of a no, question no or? yeah no no not a commercial so regarding you, the uh, common salt no. because we don't common have salt an, is fine. Yeah. we don't have if a you dosage want, uh, we just say give a half teaspoon over every fourth hour no, leave give a one to two day. grams per day or something yeah. and you have a yeah, one to two grams per day over the day the dietary if you are getting a mal they do add like that if you order one to two grams per day extra common salt so that they measure in our dietary we used to do ask that and they can add on that's what you are asking right is yes. there any prescribed yeah. amount yeah yeah thank you sir thank you so the one the salt that uh, dietary people keep giving they roughly usually say 1 gram has around 17 millicoulombs that's what they say so you can if you want to really calculate you can calculate based on that uh but usually we end up writing 1 gram 2 gram based on the size i mean the patient's weight and then accordingly we write and they do respond quite well by the time you write 2 to 3 gram it does go up uh if they are on ng tubes it's fine otherwise probably the feeds will get very salty because uh, oral salt is uh, giving uh, sodium without free water so it should uh, if it is possible it is uh, No, no, but we said so we do extra like that. As you are asking, it comes to one thirty, and then we put extra salt or one to two grams per day. That's what we do. But do, what do you do in your uh, practice? Yeah, the same thing, sir. We also try to do that, but somehow it doesn't go up as expected. It doesn't work, huh? <laughs> so it doesn't yeah, go up. Yeah. Yeah. So why are you, are you concerned? Do you want to bring the patient no, because no, he's symptomatic? No. Asymptomatic? No, so it sir, can come on its own if you are put on a oral and enteral nutrition. Yeah, it takes some time, so we leave it as yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, so I mean these are more easily said than done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and one another question I was posted, ma'am, is regarding the enteral feeding. Once we switch over from the IV to enteral feeding, how strictly you follow the fluid restriction? Because one side the fluid restriction, other side the nutrition part. and uh, do you strictly follow the yeah. food yeah yeah so there is no no hard and fast rule clinical practices vary but a uh, uh, small amount you can just write uh, feeds as extra so until you reach a volume uh, the feeds can be extra because there will be anyway loss in the stool uh, so until we reach sort of you know 20% or 25% of the total volume the the feed is calculated as feed extra and then after that maybe uh, you can start accounting once you reached a reasonable volume what would the answer jolly do you have but in cardiac and the speciality we do take into account we will bring it down when they step up and especially cardiac is very much transplant we need to have a little more on the positive side so doesn't matter so we might but still we need to calculate and we need Yeah, pretty much the same thing, ma'am. Uh, even I thought if it is cardiac, then definitely we still continue to restrict even when it's uh, enteral. I think neurologists and all when they are trying to give based on calories, they are not worried about the volume they keep going up. But uh, probably enteral you can give slightly more if they are stable. But otherwise, if it is cardiac where you want them dry and all, it's safer to stick to the two third maintenance even if it is enteral. but even in our icu you look at what we do you just try up the feeds and we just there may not be a hard and fast rule but you tend to bring down your iv fluids right yes so of course so when you do send the you know your patient is intubated what do you want you want a little bit of a drier side right so you yes. want to uh, restrict the volume including the uh, feeds what do you do yeah definitely when sometimes it goes like beyond the fifth day and sixth day and then yeah. we got to get stuck up with the ventilators we look at the nutrition sometimes the nutrition requirement will come to around 120 ml per kg per day so sometimes it becomes very tough to titrate and the balance all this that's why just so we have seen we have, we have like that we are ventilating a patient so only really full on enteral feeds we may start just 100 ml for some potassium some correction if needed otherwise fully on enteral feeds on sure sir thank you sir yeah um 
So then there's another question by Gaurav to everyone. Uh, there's a newborn uh, on day seven of life who came with sodium of 190 primary equivalence per liter. What should be the sodium concentration of the infusate in this child in the initial hours? And is there any easy formula to prepare? Is his question for a desired sodium concentration? So I will uh, just direct this question to Abor. What is that? Is, newborn with uh, 195 sodium. What should what be should the, be the um, initial fluid? So we we tend to follow the in our pediatric ICU. We follow the birth weight and just give as Kala was mentioning about like maintenance plus maintenance and the 10 percent correction. Yeah. But our neonatal ICU follow different. They you add some more sodium and keep like a hypertonic fluid to prevent further uh, uh, down, the frequent uh, uh, drop in the sodium. Yeah. So they prepare it, but we don't do that. So, but here, the, the, yeah. So the sodium in saline is 154 and the patient's is 195. So the gap of 40. So still sometimes the sodium can drop fast, even with normal saline. And uh, um, so, in uh, so there is so we have used only saline, and most of our patients, even with these values, uh, we uh, haven't got much trouble. I mean, our experience has been okay, but newborns do use a higher sodium uh, infusate. Yes, yes. So okay. they do add more and keep it like 160, 170, slowly. 160 by adding 3% saline, and uh, okay, I am not aware of that. Uh, uh, I think yeah. if it's more than 190, they try to add and touch 180. So they give only a gap of 10 to 15. They don't allow more than that. Yeah. So that's what uh, Benji and Dr. Sridhar were saying. So they calculate like that up to 180 and then they will allow the falls very slowly. But we just uh, do with DNS, no ma'am. Yeah. Last time well, we had checked with uh, them. I mean, yeah. practiced the last three patients have done very well. If you know that ideal, not the ideal birth yeah. weight, we have. I think if you, yeah. birth take weight, the birth weight, weight maintenance, replacement, maintenance, maintenance, give it slowly, like calculate the whole thing and give it. Uh, and how often would you uh, advise to check the sodium in these situations in hypo, hypernatal, or any electrolyte imbalance? So uh, everyone has an idea. Six thoroughly is a must, mandatory. So it um, might be difficult in peripheral situation, probably, that yeah. need to have an arterial line will be good, but um, yeah. monitoring and uh, yeah. because there is no order, even if you use the formula with the free water deficit, there is a tendency to fall off. So you need to be dynamically. What do you say, Kala? Yeah, I think six towel is reasonable. However, yeah, sampling, you have to weigh that against sampling difficulties and uh, multiple pokes for the baby. Uh, you could uh, do it more closely also in an ICU setup for hourly also. Uh, but again, all these will be your practical difficulties of sampling and uh, that sort of thing. So six hour is a reasonable trade-off and a reasonable uh, time to check. What do you say, Deepika, what do you do? Yes, yeah. I mean, I we we normally do that. It's easy. We also yeah. rely on uh, blood gases, of, which gives us instant yeah. value. At least the estimate of what we are doing is okay, because yeah. the lab values will take an hour extra. So, um, I would like to ask a thing. So, when now we have discussed the hypernatremia, uh, so what uh, when we treat hyperkalemia, as we already saw the Salbutamol is the first thing to start with, and then by the time you get the cannula and then start with the calcium. So what would be the bolus and the maintenance in such situation? Or which fluids would you recommend? Would you still go with sodium chloride or different? Uh, do you have a different view on that? Uh, I didn't get your question, Deepika. Sorry. I think it's so just... So if we are treating hyperkalemia... In hyperkalemia, yeah. Yes. So which maintenance or the bolus fluid would you recommend? Which uh, bolus fluid for? Hyperkalemia. Uh, hi so will it be the why same do you want as to give... chloride or? Why do you want to give bolus uh, fluid? Because... 
Now, in case if they are in septic shock or with rhabdomyolysis and landing up in acidosis and hyperkalemia. You are asking about balanced solution. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, will you yeah, normalize or balanced solution if available? Yeah, but we are, uh, yeah, balanced solution or not. Uh, now only start balanced available. solution has uh, potassium. Is yes, that your concern? Balanced solution has uh, potassium. Yes, yeah. And therefore, whether it is safer to Yes, uh, yeah, whether it is safe uh, to use that. So, okay, so if a patient with hyperkalemia needs fluid bolus, which bolus uh, fluid is preferable? Yes, is that yeah. the question? Yes, please, because if we take um, ice, uh, yeah. plasma light or ringers, yeah. we do have some potassium, isn't it? In so, logic would be to avoid potassium containing fluid. So yeah, if you apply that, yeah, normal, logic. Plasma light does not have, yeah, plasma light has five milliequivalents per liter. So if you so give a liter, liter it's, if yeah, you give it's plasma easy. light also in a normal potassium, or if you don't know the potassium in IC in a emergency also we have given plasma light as a fluid bonus. But if you are saying rhabdomyolysis and you want to give as a volume replacement. If you yeah. know the potassium is high, then probably we tend to avoid and give a normal yeah, normal. yeah, because you know it you has. Know, uh, mm, it does not. Yeah, I think so. It will be prudent to avoid uh, potassium containing uh, fluid. So if you know the potassium and you you have to choose between normal saline and plasma light, uh, what is the practice there? So here, I mean, the newest APLS guidelines have suggested using plasma light because they believe the acetate in plasma light gets converted into bicarb and uh, water. So, you know, that will, and H plus ions and then gets, so that will actually, the bicarb will add on to the alkalosis and that will reduce the acidity and hence help potassium. So they haven't really found, uh, so this is what is, because it's recently added, like literally now, in the APLS guidelines. So the practice there is slightly different from here. So they do recommend plasma light. It's obviously it's worrying. So I just want to know from you all what yeah. it's yeah. uh, scary. To so this. plasma light has uh, just five millimoles per liter. So even yes, if yeah. you use it, it's not a high quantity. No, if you give, um, if you infuse one liter, you put in five millimoles. So it's not too mm. much, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. It's just because it has potassium, so we think it is loud, but it might not be the situation. It's still not into complete practice here. They've just recommended, and people are going to be resistant to do that initially. But if the evidence is suggested, then maybe. Yeah. Anything else? Anyone else? So I haven't. Anything. Uh, okay. Yeah, one, one question again from Sindhil here. Uh, regarding your experience with uh, albumin in dengue patients. Our experience, or so we Using haven't generated any any evidence. Abor is trying to do a study, and he'll come up with uh, evidence. So the use of albumin, we used to use a lot more albumin, uh, Sendel, uh, okay. a few years ago. Of late, uh, we haven't used much albumin actually, because um, uh, if you if you just follow your WHO protocol um, and uh, sort of recognize early and keep sticking to the fluid. Most patients uh, get away without needing albumin. Um, so that is my experience. Um, our use has been very restricted, very, very, very restricted only in uh, dengue. Although last few years, we haven't seen much very severe dengue. And now the study is going on. So most patients go under the WHO and ICMR fluid. Uh, okay. Regimen. Do you have you put albumin in your ICMR regimen? Or is there a role no, for albumin? For no role of albumin. Resuscitating dengue. Dengue with warning signs or dengue with compensated shock. I don't think there is even we compared in Thailand with all these three regimens of albumin and crystalloids, mm -hmm. and they have found the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, but in severe dengue, when they are coming to ICU with your severe capillary leak and severe shock, probably you might consider, but that again, a shock management and to prevent multi-organ dysfunction. 
So, Sandal, that is what your question. In your yes, sir. out yes. of ICU, out of HTU or out of the ward, there is no role. Only uh, probably studies also proven it is equal. So, it is more expensive to give this volume replacement as albumin. So, coming to septic, I saw a severe dengue. We, as Kala was mentioning, we were using it like uh, mixing uh, albumin and uh, coming we down. Used like to, we used to try 2% uh, albumin. Yeah, we were 2% albumin. But that was more infection coming rather than uh, helping the patients. So now in our IC, even in severe dengue, we rarely see them now. But uh, we just give the crystalloids. But if they are in a hypotensive shock for a short period, it is not like a replacement we are giving. Probably over an hour of 5% albumin we use. Do you still give albumin, uh, Sandil? That's, yes, uh, sir. Your yes, sir. I, that's why I'm asking. The severe dengue patients, uh, mm. sometimes they have a very drastic uh, response to albumin. Uh, so I'm scared to, re to replicate that in other patients. But in some patients, we have seen very drastic improvement with albumin infusions. Uh, so one, how 5% or 20% you use? Uh, this is 5%, sir. So 5% like you mean, yeah, as a bolus or as not, a volume replacement? Not as a bolus, sir. Suppose I'm using like 10 ml per kg over an hour, or if it is 7 ml per kg, the maintenance fluid might be given as a 5% albumin. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, there is some uh, palpable improvement in the uh, uh, those patients. So just you don't give any crystalloids as a thing, only albumin 5%, yes. uh, 10 ml yeah. per kg per hour yeah. for two hours, and then you yes. ask us. Yes, yeah. as a maintenance. Yeah. So yeah, so probably, but it's for a 20 kilo child or a 40, so it'll be more albumin you need to give. And uh, so are you still seeing a lot of severe dengue now? Yes, sir. They come here. Yeah, we have seen with the MODS and severe shock. All right. So Surprisingly, please, last month we had an last month we had a couple of uh, severe dinkies with okay. mortalities also. I was wondering whether the albumin would cause a um, you know, anionic overload on the kidney, which is all relatively compromised in a shock state, because um, twenty percent I don't know whether we use it at all, but five percent yes, maybe. Uh, is there any evidence until uh, for using? 5% albumin or uh, is the practice we follow the, see, the problem is these 5% albumin children are already very sick. They come with either multi-organ failure or they are an impending multi-organ failure. So that's the reason we couldn't, if, even if at all they go for an AKI, we couldn't pinpoint whether albumin would have contributed to that or whether it is because of the disease itself. So that uh, so albumin then, contributing to AKI, I, we, we are not sure. We, Mm. Have you tried uh, plasma fluorescence in a sick severe dengue? Uh, no, sir. No. Okay. Probably you yeah. can try with uh, some renal support and plasma fluorescence. I don't know. This we plasma fluorescence is organ uh, failure. This plasma fluorescence, I think, will come up in a big way for every uh, sort of problem, yeah. I think. It's like that yes, our again, septic shock, thrombocytopenia associated. Yeah. Uh, multi organ failure time off, there is a role for plasma pharesis. Okay. So, we have done a couple of in the maybe in 2019, and uh, but we lost that they were at a later stage. We started plasma pharesis, and I'm just wondering uh, if they are affordable. This season, we are not at uh, the severe dengue in ICU yet. But we are getting a lot of other dengues in the ward and in our emergency with volume replacement. That we are doing a study comparing uh, two regimens, like not like because WHO you need to give every two hourly and hourly, like you need to monitor. And so here we have like like a dehydration correction. You give it over six hours. So that is one arm we are doing, like 30 ml per kg over six hours, and then you. Yeah. But that so is not a just, mm. okay. no, just uh, with regard to albumin, I think there is another question from Dr. Uh, Chinnaswamy. What is the role of prophylactic role of albumin in burns? 
Oh, it's funny you should ask this because <laughs> our pediatric surgeons uh, believe in uh, albumin in burns. Again, these are there are no easy answers. It's it's very unlikely you will find any literature saying give this or give not give this. Um, so uh, again, burns, uh, we do do large volume resuscitation. So very large volume resuscitation um, sometimes can affect your wound healing and uh, because of tissue edema again. And, and that's the case for albumin. So they say if you give albumin, if you can reduce the uh, volume of fluid in, infused um, so, uh, it's, it's just uh, the answer sometimes our surgeons, they say, give about 10 or 20% of the volume as albumin. Um, so, when you say prophylactic uh, role, is it a prophylactic role against, uh, uh, I'm not sure what prophylaxis you're referring to, but the role of albumin is in the fluid uh, resuscitation for uh, burns. Uh, giving too much fluid can interfere with your wound healing and uh, because of the tissue edema and therefore uh, in develop, prevent developing shock. Huh? Uh, okay, so it's just uh, fluid uh, resuscitation only. Yeah, so I think, uh, so that will be the answer. Uh, there is a, a role for albumin as part of your uh, overall fluid that you manage, that you write up for your burns patient you could maybe give 10 or 20 percent as uh, albumin um, it again reference uh, the, a lot of clinic individual preferences are there some surgeons are very keen on overall the surgical department at least in velour are keen that we give some albumin for burns patients you can be guided yeah yeah go ahead Kala. I'm not sure. You can be guided maybe by serum albumin, but serum albumin also has its own problem because of the half-life uh, being short. So that also you cannot be guided. I mean, we do look at serum albumin, but of course you cannot be fully be guided by your serum albumin as well. Uh, so there is a role, uh, not prophylactic uh, to prevent shock, uh, but albumin has a role in the fluid management of uh, burns patient. Uh, some percent of your overall fluid can be given as uh, albumin. Um, again, I have not read anything recently in burns. Uh, Deepika, would you like to add anything more? No, ma'am. I mean, um, here uh, the places I have been is mainly cardiac intensive and uh, general intensive care, so I really don't have much of experience of burns as such. Uh, but then the ones who come into a &E, we we usually follow the uh, set protocol, the same um, one that uh, HM, 16, um, 16 percent initially, and uh, you know that uh, that's the thing. But other than that, we use our routine fluids. We don't use albumin. Yeah, in the any &E, at least what we do. So Jolly, you may want to add anything to this question or ever to prevent. Question for in a prophylactic albumin, you mean? Or? Sorry. Yeah, roll for uh, in burns. Yeah, yeah. So again, it's like a volume replacement therapy. It is not mm, for yeah, not for shock. So we need to be um, differentiating both uh, separately. So shock is when there is more than twenty percent loss and acutely you are giving. So is volume replacement uh, as your explanation is enough? That is, I agree with you. That's it. I can um, share the UHL protocol, what we follow on the thing, and then you can have a look. I can share that. Okay. Uh, Deepika, would you like to say a final comment? Uh... Yes, yeah, it's been a very informative, interactive sessions. And uh, as I already mentioned, um, keywords, buzzers, we all should take home today. Um, uh, we do find electrolytes and uh, fluid therapy it's very routine, it's in our hand, it's only in white matter. It needs a lot of our gray matter to, you know, you actually need to go back and check. So it could be in uh, hands, but uh, we need to keep checking. Um, and uh, also thank you so much, ma'am. It was, it was great um, sitting today. And uh, it's been a very long time I've had this uh, discussion. I've been in intensive care two years ago 
after one year ago and after that uh, there's been a gap with different postings different places thank you so much for inviting and Nibor sir thank you thank you thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, your time